All right, our first talk is from Buses Can Fly. Thank you so much, man, for kicking us off on this Saturday morning. I really appreciate it. This first talk is uh, Hardware Hacking for the Masses and You by Buses Can Fly. So take it away, man. Hey, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, really excited to give this talk. But yeah, my talk is Hardware Hacking for the Masses and You. First, uh, boring disclaimer, you know, all the general stuff. I'm not a lawyer. Don't crime. Uh, be responsible. Have fun. Don't be dumb. Cite your sources. So I am Buses Can Fly. You can find me on Twitter at, at Buses Can Fly and really around the internet with that handle. I'm just a noob exploring what I find for fun. It's, it's a hobby for me. I love embedded and automotive hacking, car hacking, all sorts of hardware. I'm a student. I love rock climbing, quadcopter flying, and just generally messing around with electronics. So first off, a little overview of hardware hacking. You know, what is it? And that kind of raises the question of what's regular hacking? It's making stuff what it's not supposed to do, finding out secrets. It's, there's no exact definition. It can be, in, there's some overlying topics between hardware hacking and general hacking, but overall it's all just trying to do whatever you want to do. It's, if you can touch it, make it do stuff it's not supposed to do, and it's fun, you're hardware hacking. So some really common questions I get is, isn't hardware hacking hard? Which, no, yes, it, it depends. It, depending on the level you're looking at and what you want to do, there's, there's something for everyone. But can you hack hardware? Absolutely. What do you need to get started? Well, that's what this presentation's for. And then isn't hardware hacking expensive? It depends. There's some extremely expensive tools out there. There's a lot you can get for really cheap or for basically free. Actually, the way I got started with hardware hacking was out of a dumpster. I was at a local conference, and they had a destruction village for the kids. And there were a bunch of old routers in there. So I took two out that were the same model, cobbled them together into one, bought a $3 serial cable, and that's... That was my first time hardware hacking. There's this big misconception I hear a lot at conferences. There's you know, brilliant people doing web stuff and crazy cool you know, exploit development. But they go like, hardware? Oh, man, that's, oof, that's the scary stuff. That's hard stuff. And I disagree with that. I think just like anything else, it can be, you can definitely get started in it for not, not too much money and not too much difficulty. So how do you learn? The way I started was doing a lot of electronics projects. I love little single board computers, Raspberry Pis, Banana Pis, Orange Pis. The, the whole single board Linux computers are great. And they have these GPIO pins, similar to the Arduinos, which are also on this slide. And then general electronics projects. I think they're super helpful. Actually, let's see here. Over here, actually, is one of the first electronic projects I've ever did, which is kind of a very simple one. It's a 555 timer, which is a type of um, integrated circuit. And with that, you can do a lot of stuff. You can make a little circuit to change how fast it pulses something out. But there's this great project on Makezine where you can make your own rapid fire miles using this timer and entirely just hardware. Uh, you can make it, you know, rapid fire for whatever you want to do, video games or whatnot, but, you know, be responsible. But there's a lot of really good resources between projects there's a lot of good books, and at the end of the slide, I dumped a lot of resources, links to things, things to watch, uh, things to read. So I have a whole list up there. Web resources, as always, Google's your best friend. Uh, there's a few good, great YouTube channels right here and some more at the end, and then forums that'll add more also at the end of the slides. But there's a ton of really accessible and easy to understand resources. But I highly recommend just going out, Googling stuff, finding a project that looks really cool to you, and just doing it. Don't worry about it if it seems too hard or if it seems like you don't understand it. Just have at it and eventually you'll get it. And you'll learn a ton on the way and just do a lot of random projects. So some really quick things to know in basics that are pretty important. Uh, the first idea is uh, baud rate. So that's the formal definition you can see up there. But basically it's just you know you, how fast you can transfer information. This is a graph over here. Here's a graph of that. Just, you know, bit, uh, ones and zeros. A lot of hardware, you have a thing called a clock speed, which I'll talk more about some hardware terms later. But it's 
how fast and how often these bits are transferred on a network, which, as you can see, it's, it gets pretty simple. But there's a few common baud rates. We'll talk about it later, about how to interface with a lot of hardware uh, simply. But a few things you need to know is that communication speed. Because if you're hooking up to some piece of hardware and you're trying to talk at a different speed that it, than it's listening, or you're listening at a different speed it's talking to, you only get a gibberish out. So there's a few really common baud rates which you can see right here, but the really main ones are 9600 and this one, 115, 200. That's the number of bits per second and the most common. Uh, there's a Python tool I linked somewhere in this presentation, uh, also at the end of the slides, that's really great. You just run it and it tries all the different baud rates and you can see where the sensible information comes out so you can figure that out. But generally, whenever I'm doing something, I just try this and then this one. So, yeah, that's important to know, just the speed of communication and what's going on. Then some really common electronics terms. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with really basic circuit stuff, which is basically there's a positive and there's a negative, and your circuit has to complete in a circle. Obviously, PCBs, printed circuit boards, and a lot of hardware, it's a lot more complicated than just a loop, but all the terms are still the same. You have VCC, which basically is just you know voltage. There is voltage. Ground is the negative connection. You have RX, which means receive, and TX, which is transmit. And this will come up later. So UART is a communication protocol. You usually have your power and your ground somewhere on the AC, IC, and then you have a transmit connected to some the other things uh, receive, and one thing's transmit connected to the other one receive. So these two can talk back and forth to each other. But we'll get more into UART and other stuff later on. Um, yeah, and then how to find information about hardware. This is really underrated. Um, with everything, recon is a huge thing beforehand, and you can figure out basically everything you need to know without actually touching the hardware. So there's a ton of information online. Data sheets are a gold mine. Data sheets and schematics can contain that you would ever need. Uh, it's a ton of information, but it's all super useful. So information about the ICs in the board, the processors. Normally, I don't know, it's the best picture. You see down here, there's usually words on these chips and a lot of other stuff. If you just pipe that right into Google, like don't, you don't even need to know what it means. Just look it up, like Texas Instruments something or NXP or whatever. Just Google that, uh, at Meg Chips. You'll find like 20 page PDFs with data sheets and they'll tell you whatever you need. Don't worry if you don't understand everything. Whatever you can find there is gonna be super useful. Then an, a hugely underrated resource is uh, FCC documents online. So any device, I believe, sold in the U.S. has to have, that, that um, communicates over some sort of radio frequency, has to have an FCC ID. I put some example stickers here I just found online. Like right here, there's an FCC ID. Here, oh, that's a MAC address. Uh, there's someone, there's, whatever, it's somewhere on this one. <laughs> but right, right here and right here, examples of FCC IDs, there's usually, there has to be a specific sticker for this. And that number, there's a way to do it through FCC's official uh, website, but this FCC.io site is amazing. It'll forward everything. You'll get the documents there. It's great. And these documents generally contain a lot of information about what it's doing, so which frequencies it's communicating on. Sometimes you get, well, usually you get internal pictures of the hardware, which is amazing. We'll talk later in this presentation about finding debug pins and what to look for in the circuit boards. But a lot of the time, before ever getting a piece of hardware, I go to these FCC documents, look at internal pictures. You can try to identify stuff just from the pictures they provide. And different specifications about the hardware, and this can vary. Sometimes a company can uh, request to, sup um, to um, suppress some information and file that, but usually that still doesn't cover internal pictures and you still know what frequency everything's operating on. And even if you don't know the frequency, there's a lot of ways you can figure that out. And we'll talk more about that later too. And another way to get information, obviously, is the firmware. Sometimes that's just online. You can just go to the manufacturer's website, whoever made the hardware, download the firmware, and reverse engineer it from there. If not, you can dump it off the hardware itself, but we'll talk about that also a little later. So then, getting into the hardware. What do you look for? You know, So now you've got you know, this router, you've cracked it open, you know, what's inside? So the main thing we look for is what we call debug informations. So like when you write program, you need debug information. You need just extra information to help facilitate whatever you're making. So the code has to be loaded on the devices somehow, right? 
and the devs need a way to see extra information or interact with their devices. So there's a lot of, there's these different uh, standards for little things on the circuit board for how you can hook it up and how you can hook up to those debug uh, ports and get extra information out of them. And sometimes if you're lucky, you just plug in a cable basically to these pins and it drops you straight to a root shell. It's unfortunately common. There's not a ton to it. Sometimes you'll land into a busy box shell, some sort of limited shell, something custom. And then one time I was looking at this one piece of industrial um, equipment and no joke, it dropped me for, into ARM, uh, Arm, Arch Linux for ARM, which I didn't know was a thing beforehand and probably shouldn't be the thing that this industrial equipment's running. But you know, anything's possible. Root shells are common. Sometimes you just get uh, information as it's booting, which can be super useful. You can pull a lot from that. And there's ways to kind of get it to then give you a shell or uh, mess with that to put it, get into that. And I won't talk about that a ton here, but it's definitely something to look into. But how do we get this information? There's a couple, as I mentioned earlier, uh, protocols and standards for how to communicate with hardware. So there's things like UR and JTAG, which I have slides about later, which are just pins or uh, things like uh, test pads on a board that you can talk to. There's these communication protocols like SPI, I2C or I2C, however you want to say it, uh, just worth a Google. Uh, you'll see that a lot in Arduino projects you do that. This is the SPI interface model. Uh, then you have some more common interfaces. Like if you're looking at a router, USB and Ethernet, really common, but very underrated. There's a lot you can talk to them sometime because there's data going there. That's always useful. And then, oh yeah, here's the link I was talking about with the Python tool to identify baud rate. Uh, there's four tools I put right there. I, I don't know. Screen, Minicom, Miniterm, Putty, whatever you want. They all can do serial connections. There's a bajillion more. Uh, I don't know. If it works for you, it works. Um, yeah, use whatever you need. And then I have some pictures here, but we'll talk about this later. These are uh, the tools you can use to interface with a lot of hardware. And yeah, I'll get deeper into it. So you are. This is a huge one. This is basically, if you understand this, like 60% of those low-lying, uh, this is the low-lying fruit in a lot of hardware talking, in a lot of hardware hacking. So UART stands for a universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. That's a mouthful, but universal makes sense. Asynchronous also kind of makes sense. And then receive transmit, that makes sense. We were looking at a model of this earlier. So UART is generally four different pins. Here's a picture of a UART breakout. There's also one here where the company helpfully pre-soldered the pins on. But it's generally four pins. And the thing is, you really only need to hook up to three. Because VCC is the fourth one. So there would be a VCC up here. And we talked about that earlier. Voltage. The thing is, normally, let's say the router example again. You're powering the router, and you want to hook up to UART. The router already has power. So then when you hook up the VCC pin on your UART cable, stuff isn't super happy. And even though this is like a super basic thing to know, this is how I blew up one of the USB ports in my laptop. It's a huge new mistake. I fried so many pieces of hardware like that. Generally just hook up uh, RXTX and ground. And this cable, I have a slide later showing that, but red is generally VCC, black is ground, and you have RXTX, which are green and white. Just don't, don't hook up the red one. Red is for danger, I don't know, snip it off or something. You probably won't need it. But yeah, how do you identify UR breakouts on hardware? But generally, you can just do trial and error, but there's kind of small tricks and standards that you, you develop over time. Ground, the ground pin is usually square. Like you can see it right here, it's a special square. But also, ground is shared across the hardware. So basically, every component needs a link to ground because that's how circuits work in that loop. So you can find anything that is ground, which, you know, there's a like RF shield on hardware, which is like this looks like a little metal box covering whatever it, um, is broadcasting RF. That's usually grounded. I mean, every piece, one side is going to be grounded. Yeah. But it's shared across the board if you don't have a specific pin or you want to like hack your way into UART. Uh, the VCC, the voltage trace, is usually a little thicker. Uh, that's just a standard, just because it has to carry the power. Um, but again, you don't really need to hook up to it. So if you can figure out ground, which is pretty easy because it's either a square or labeled or you know something like that, RX and TX are kind of just you know 50-50. Like if this was voltage, we're not going to hook that up. This is ground, and then these two are RX and TX. Uh, choose one, just like 
put uh, one in each. And if gibberish comes out, flip them. <laughs> just do the other combination. Because if you flip these, it'll just look weird. And then you just flip them, and then it works. Um, but tools for identifying this, you can use oscilloscopes and logic analyzers. They're super nice. Uh, <laughs> An oscilloscope is a tool that displays kind of voltages over time. So you can visualize what's happening in a certain place. And logic analysts do similar things. But basically, it's just a magic device. You can hook it up to these pins and see what kind of voltage is going on. So if you see a solid line at the top and it says like 5 volts, it's probably VCC. Uh, and then RX and TX might do might have these little like crazy waves or something, depending on what they broadcast. But yeah, that's UART. This is the thing to go for in a lot of things. If you see four pins in a line on a piece of hardware, either that are in these kind of headers or holes, probably you are probably can drop you straight to a shell or it'll get you at least uh, more information. Great to go for. And then, okay, that was weird. Uh, slightly out of time, but whatever. So here's some UART examples. I took this picture a day ago. I was just prepping something for slides. But this router, and I have some pictures later where we can look at identifying these things. But you can see here ground RX and TX. And it's just hooked up to a router, hooked up to a serial adapter, and then going to my computer. So this can drop you to different stuff. These are online, but I found like TP-Link has their weird specific shell for some of their routers. And you can try escaping out of this limited shell into you know, like a busy box shell with more permissions and then doing whatever. Here's a screenshot of that baud rate tool where it hooked up using this baud rate and you get a bunch of information as stuff boots. This is a uh, UART cable. This is like Adafruit's fancy one, but I was just looking, I wanted a picture with the different pins. And these are the colorings for the pins. Ooh, that is not green, okay. Well, this is green and this is blue. Don't worry about it. But RX, TX, ground, and VCC. Don't hook up the red one if the device is powered or else stuff goes boom. And the question is, you know, what now? If it lands you to a root shell, you know, it's kind of up to you. This is where maybe hopefully previous experience kicks in. You know what you're looking for in like a Linux environment. You can look for private keys or different stuff. You know, changing the firewall rules on routers is always fun. And then kind of what, you know, a community standard and my personal favorite thing to do is just load Doom on things. I've played Doom on tons of automobiles, on a 50 kilowatt hour car charger, uh, on so many things just aren't supposed to run Doom and are so much fun when you play Doom on them. But these are some things you can expect when you hook up over serial. Uh, another interface is JTAG, which was made and put into effect by the Joint Test Action Group. Uh, it's This is a weird one for sure. So the pin count can vary, and you can see there's uh, different uh, standards for that, but they have basically the same core uh, pins. It, yeah, pin count can vary. Core amount stays the same. It can be, and then quote unquote, secured with a key or password, which is common to uh, have the manufacturer put some kind of key in, but if the key is common across all of their devices, it's the same key, and one person dumps it and then shares it to everyone else, then you can you know bypass that. JTAG's kind of hit or miss when you're playing with hardware. Uh, if the, if the manufacturer labels it, they're being amazing, or if they tell you you know which one a corner and they follow the standard. Well, there's tools like the JTAGulator, it makes it a lot easier to identify what pins are doing what and how you can hook up to that. And after that, the information you get is pretty similar to uh, what you get out of UART. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So I took some pictures a little bit ago of some routers. I just cracked them open, took a picture of the inside. And I thought it'd be fun to just kind of look over it. So right now, you, if you're watching this, take a look. Uh, you know, what do you see that's interesting? So, I don't know. Right off the bat, there's a lot here. So this is an example of the RF shield I was talking about. This little metal box, which hopefully is grounded, which is nice. And usually these huge pads would be grounded too. But this is inside here is something that broadcasts RF. This heat sink means there's probably something that put heat out under that. So some sort of CPU Broadcom chip for RF. This is a bunch of Ethernet ports and ooh, MAC address. Oops. Um, like USB ports. This is power in, a reset button, an antenna, a bunch of capacitors, uh, some chips. I would definitely look up these IDs. Uh, the FCC ID is on the bottom of this. But the really neat thing you can see right off the bat is over here. Looks like we have a JCAB breakout, JTAG breakout, something else. I'm not sure of yet. But if you look right there, they were helpful enough to solder on the headers for us at the manufacturer. And look, they even labeled them VCC, RX, TX, and ground. That's great. So when you hook up the cable to this, 
dumps you actually this one to a busy box shell. It's pretty nice. And then another example. This one did not blow up super well, so I'm sorry, it's really blurry. Um, but you can see right there, JTAG, and you can really not see right here, but there's another four pin UART. And what's interesting is just, you know, unsoldered connectors here. That could be pretty fun to see what's there. I think I have another example. Yep, this one blew up kind of better, but it's still pretty grainy, so sorry. But if you look here, still a lot going on. Not sure what these are, but worth taking a look if you look online. More chip names, status LEDs, you know, voltage regulator, and then right there. Looks like we have JTAG and UART with pre-soldered headers. Love it when they do that. Uh, another example, same stuff, JTAG, something else. Worth taking a look at, but yeah. Over time, when you start to look at these things, you just start to see them a lot quicker, and it's just worth picking that up. Uh, and it, it, it gets weird. There's lots of different standards and techniques that the manufacturers of the hardware use. There's different formats, like this kind of JTAG breakout. This one's helpfully labeled, but it, it changes. There's these things. This is kind of a crazy example I found online, but these little like gold circles that are a little wider, those are test points for testing hardware. They're not always super interesting. But you can use something like a logic analyzer to map them out. Uh, you might be able to like make your own UART interface out of like that one, that one, that one. I don't know. So on an extreme level, it might be uh, fun mapping those out. But you learn a lot of this through experience. You know, the more things you watch, the more resources you look at. There's just a lot to know, and it, it's hard to figure that out to find that out all at once. So this is an example of a PCB with vias, which are these little dots here, the ones with the hole in the middle. They just connect different layers of the PCB. Because circuit boards, if you didn't know, uh, very commonly have multiple layers, just you know, to fit more stuff on them and to communicate. And some of the layers communicate this way. This makes it sometimes hard, because you can see these traces on the PCB. And actually, let's go to a previous picture. Um, you can kind of see here these little lines in the circuit board connecting parts. That's exactly what they're doing. So you can actually trace these lines a lot. And we were looking at the uh, UR interfaces. Let's see if I have a better picture. Yeah, like here, you can look at the UR interface. These lines coming off of the pins are what the pins are connected to. They're like, instead of a wire on a breadboard or something, these are on the circuit board manufactured in, with the, in the silicon. So you can usually trace these out. And when I say the VCC trace is a little thicker, that's like this line is generally a little, a little thicker. So let's go back. And vias can connect those layers and traces. So sometimes the vias make it hard to follow, but you can usually just kind of with your finger look at that. And if the via ends up on the other end, you can follow that trace there. But just, you know, skills to gain over time. And then there's a lot of different hardware hacking, like anything else, you know, web or just hacking in general. It's not one thing. There's so many different kind of sub subcategories. I'm a huge fan of automotive and car hacking. I think it's a ton of fun. And these two pictures over here are kind of like very core to car hacking. This is the OBD2 connector, which is the thing under the dash of your car that uh, gets plugged into when you go to emissions testing. There's a couple really important uh, pins, but you know, 614 and 311 are the ones you look at a lot. Um, and this is an example of a CAN frame, which is how, that, uh, how the um, CAN network works in a car. But to find out more about that, I linked another presentation at the end by a good friend of mine, Spectres. He did a, a level up talk in level up 0x04 about getting started with car hacking. So check that out if you're interested. IoT devices are you know, huge for hardware hacking, whether it's, I don't know, doorbells and locks to smart TVs and routers. There's just so much going on. And honestly, a lot of them are terrible. As we've learned from things like Mirai and all that, security isn't really something people pay for. So there's a lot of devices just hook up a serial cable and it just drops you to root shell. And then from there, you can do you know, more recon, find bugs. Once you have a root shell or the firmware, uh, you can do a lot of stuff to try and get more info. Like if you dump the firmware off a device, you can use a tool called Binwalk to carve files out of that, and you can sometimes get the whole file system. Whatever, you can look for that, look for um, vulnerable things and get a lot of information that way. There's a lot of ICS and SCADA stuff in hardware, and this is a scary field. This is uh, industrial control systems, and I forget the SCADA um, acronym, honestly, but whatever. Industrial control stuff. This is like the super important nuclear power plant powering uh, electronics. 
and they're not always the most stable. Like if they have some sort of uh, network connection, a lot of them crash when you end map them and stuff like that, which is kind of scary, but it's a cool place to be. Uh, planes, trains, predator, predator drones, they're all hackable and they're all hardware. So I know planes and trains communicate over CAN in the same way a lot of cars do and a lot of things do. Uh, predator drones, I'm not sure, but I'd love to find out. If anyone has a Predator drone and would let me mess with it, hit me up. Uh, oh, car chargers, that's a ton of fun. Car chargers actually implement sometimes the same CAN communication technology. And usually they're just running, you know, BusyBox or something in the background. There's one I was playing with that just ran X Ubuntu. Uh, that was fun. Uh, voting machines. Check out the voting machine village at DEF CON. But, you know, don't destabilize governments or anything. But this is a picture, I believe, from the DEF CON voting machine, uh, voting, uh, voting machine village. A lot of voting machines are actually like pretty terrible, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, follow stuff online for that. I don't know, like at Hacker Fantastic, I think is, he did some stuff with that. And then, you know, regular phones. Uh, years and years ago, phone freaking was the big hardware hacking. It still is. It's pretty awesome. But just regular phones now have a lot going on, too. Uh, I think just recently with the um, Checkmate exploit for the iPhone boot ROM stuff, someone also published a JTAG uh, debugger, a physical hardware thing for iPhone. So that's fun too. Um, and then tools. This is my favorite part. Um, hardware hacking is a ton of fun. I don't know. I, I love tools and my little kits. And a lot of these can get kind of expensive, but a lot of them are pretty cheap. Like we were talking about uh, serial breakouts, getting a UART cable for like three dollars that can break fine it's worth it i've had the same uart cable for like a year and a half now and it's gotten me so many different shells it's wonderful just three bucks pull a thing out of a dumpster and you're on your way there's a lot of other you know more expensive tools sometimes for very specific use cases and sometimes not the black magic probe is a great jtag adapter jtagulator and the shikra are pretty nice multi-tools for communication this is a, a cannibal, which is hooked, uh, one of the things you can use to hook up to these OBD2 ports, but there's a lot of different tools like that. Chip Whisperer, you can do advanced like glitching and power side channel attacks. It's pretty sweet. Uh, the Great Fet, it's a general purpose tool. It's amazing. Uh, Logic Analyzer is super useful. We talked about it earlier. JTagulator is a huge, uh, wonderful tool for JTAG stuff. And then, you know, some random stuff. Uh, shout out to the Exploiteers. And yeah, I have at the end of this presentation a bunch of little uh, information dumps, lots of links for you to follow, uh, talks to watch, things that have helped me a lot in the past. Um, yeah, these are great use resources. There's just so much with hardware hacking. I can't really outline it all, even in like a 30 minute talk or a 40 minute talk. There's, it's a, it's a really wide world. I really recommend just Googling stuff and just going at it, just information overload. Watch all the DEF CON hardware talking, hacking talks. Just, you know, go crazy. Do a bunch of projects. Uh, I, I put more links into here, but you just, as anything else, you pick this up over time in little chunks. See, and then, yeah, uh, here's some shout outs. My amazing friends, family, and teachers. Didn't outline a ton of people here, but you know who you are. You guys, if I know you, you're super helpful. And I appreciate you guys being around. Shout out to the Thug Crowd crew, who's actually, I believe, in chat mostly right now, our chat. Um, these are amazing people. Shout out. Uh, SAE Cyber Auto event is awesome. It takes place in Michigan. And it's generally for uh, high school and college students. Uh, you get yourself to Michigan, and they give you amazing training, and you get hands-on hacking time with a bunch of cars. The uh, Shout out to the Car Hacking Village, Bug Crowd, who's giving me a lot of opportunities with hardware hacking, and some of my friends here. But yeah, I didn't get to list a ton of people here, but you know who you are. And then I have, I believe, my images. But yeah, I'm not sure how much time we have or if I went over, but if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to hit me up on uh, Twitter, Mapbus can fly. Seriously, uh, we can talk about anything. Um, I'm happy to chat about hardware hacking if it can help. Thank you so much, man. Are you gonna, um, <clears throat> let's uh, promote your Twitter account um, because I imagine <clears throat> people will want all of these resources and we'll try to share them as well. Obviously we'll have an archived version of this talk up online so people can, check out things, but um, how can people follow you on Twitter? Yeah, I am at buses can fly, as the, the handle on the slide say. That's it. That's, that's how you can find me, probably the best way to chat. 
Uh, I'm on Discord as well. I'm in the Bug Crowd official Discord. You can find me there and DM me there if you want. But I'm I'm very reachable online. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for doing this talk. Thank you so much for everyone in the chat for watching Buses Can Fly's talk here. Give them a round of applause. We're going to have to move right into our next talks pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, Buses Can Fly. I really appreciate your presentation here. Thanks for having me. It's been a ton of fun. Awesome.